Oftentimes today we look back at the past with the feeling that people were more refined back then. That today we're much more crass and shocking. In today's episode, however, we're looking at a case that may disprove that thinking. One from 18th century England involving promiscuity, incest and murder. Today, we're looking at the story of Catherine Hayes. Born near Birmingham in 1690, Catherine's life would be one filled with troubles. Her parents were poor and newspapers at the time described her mother as being adulterous and wicked, though we're not sure if that was merely to spice up the story. It's said that when she was 15, however, a group of soldiers visited her village with Catherine taking a shine to one in particular and perhaps seeing a way to escape. She ran off with the officers to Gombersley in Worcestershire. It wasn't much of an escape though, as she had to resort to prostitution to eke out a living. The officers eventually moved on and with it went Catherine's primary clientele. She made her way to Warwickshire, looking to find work as a domestic and at 16, she was taken on as a servant working for Farmer Hayes. Mr. Hayes had two sons with the eldest John, soon catching Catherine's eye. The two soon fell for each other with them having two children out of wedlock, with at least one of these being left in a basket outside a church in the nearby village of Holtheath. Catherine insisted that they marry, much to the chagrin of John's father, who had many misgivings about the relationship. Catherine threatened suicide if the wedding didn't go ahead, however, and he soon backed down. The night of the wedding, it's said that Catherine had her newlywed husband press ganged by military officers. His father managed to get him freed, but she convinced John to enlist. Reports at the time implied that this was because she had a taste for men in uniform and this would allow her access to many of them. He signed up and it's said the pair traveled with the officers to Spain, where she indulged in all manner of debauchery and wickedness. The pair would return to the UK after John's father managed to secure his son's release for the princely sum of £60. With Catherine tired of rural life, she convinced John that they should start anew in London. Here, John set up as a coal merchant and pawnbroker, later becoming a moneylender, using funds left to him when his father passed away. Things on the outside seemed to be going well, but behind the scenes, things were deteriorating rapidly. Catherine was angry at the allowance she was being given by John, demanding more to carry on her party girl lifestyle. He refused and responded by reducing the amount he gave her instead. In 1725, she had convinced John that they should take in a lodger. He obliged and they took in a young tailor named Thomas Billings. The pair soon began having an affair, though this wasn't enough to satisfy Catherine's urges. To this end, a second lodger was also taken in, one Thomas Wood, who, handily for things to come, was a butcher by trade. With their marriage beyond repair and with divorce not really being an option in 18th century England, Catherine, along with Billings, sought to convince Wood that John Hayes must die. Catherine told him stories of how Hayes had killed a man in the country before they moved to London how he would threaten her daily, and perhaps most sinister of all, how he had killed several of their children. The truth of these accusations is lost to time. Catherine also offered Wood the 1,500 pounds she'd be worth once the deed was done. Being a religious man, Wood had misgivings, but she told him it would be no worse than killing a cat or a dog, and that John had damned Christ and said there was no God. Days passed and Wood still harbored his misgivings and even felt tempted to reveal what he had been asked to do, but did not want to bring Catherine into disrepute or lose the roof over his head. Then on the 1st of March, 1726, Thomas Wood returned to the house after visiting friends and was met at the door by Catherine. She offered him a dram of whiskey. He turned it down saying he would prefer beer. So she gave him sixpence and Wood made his way to the pub. 
Upon finishing his second pint, Thomas Billings entered the bar looking for wood. He ushered him back to the house where they had gotten their hands on some strong wine and beer. Inside, Billings, Wood, Catherine and John began drinking heavily. Had Catherine had a change of heart? All seemed well, but all was not as it seemed. Catherine and Billings were staying just sober enough. John Hayes soon had a few drinks too many and went to sleep it off. Billings followed behind and with Hayes laid inebriated in the bed, struck him in the head with a coal axe and after his legs gave a few kicks and spasms, the deed was done. Wood and Catherine rushed into the room with Catherine stating that they now had to remove his head lest they be betrayed. She brought in the knives to do the job and held a candle while the two Toms set about decapitating the corpse. The noises coming from the house alerted a neighbor who sought to check in on what was going on. Catherine brought her inside and explained that they had friends over and were just merrymaking. While the neighbor was sat there, the two Toms came downstairs with something wrapped in a bundle of cloths. Catherine told her it was merely some old clothes. Billings and Wood threw the head into the River Thames that night and the next day they cut up the body, placed it in a trunk and disposed of it in a pond. That same day, however, the head they had dumped in the Thames the night before was discovered and in an effort to identify the victim, it was stuck on a pole and displayed in the churchyard of St. Margaret's Westminster. After several days, it had the desired effect and was identified as being that of John Hayes. On March 24th, the other body parts were found and the trio was soon arrested. Wood confessed and Billings, who had been caught in bed with Catherine when the police arrived, soon admitted playing a part, but Catherine denied all knowledge of the murder. During the trial, however, she eventually reneged on her early denial, stating that she repented nothing other than involving the two men in the deed. It was also revealed to the jury that Thomas Billings, the young man she had been having an affair with, was none other than the son she had left on a church doorstep some 19 years earlier. It's reported in some of the newspapers at the time that this was the first Billings had known how closely they were related, that he had been having an affair with his own mother and that he may have killed his own father. Though some reports suggest he was the product of an affair with a local tanner. All three were eventually sentenced to death. Billings and Wood were charged with murder and so would be hanged, but Catherine had been charged with the crime of petty treason, so her death would be much worse. Petty treason was a crime wherein a subordinate would kill or otherwise violate someone above them, either in rank or social standing. Being a married woman, Catherine was seen as being lesser to her husband. The crime was seen as not just murder, but an attack on society. So, whereas Wood and Billings would be hanged, Catherine's punishment was to be burned at the stake. Wood died in prison the day before his execution from jail fever. Catherine would not be so lucky. The day of her execution was beset with troubles as a viewing platform erected for those wanting to watch collapsed with some 150 people on it, several of them being killed or injured. Before her own death, Catherine would be present to watch her son, Thomas Billings, be hanged. Then she was tied to a stake with a chain around her waist and a bundle of twigs at her feet set ablaze. Perhaps seeing how barbaric the act was, there was also a rope placed around the necks of those sentenced to die this way. So executioners could pull it tight as the fire was started, choking the person to death before the fire took hold. This day, however, the flames were fierce, and it's said that they either burned the hands of the executioner or burned through the rope, leading Catherine to scream in agony and shout, Oh Jesus, what shall I do? As she was enveloped by the blaze, she tried to beat down the flames with her hand and feet to no avail. The executioner is then said to have thrown a block of wood at her head, which cracked her skull and dashed out her brains. An hour later, she was ash. Catherine paid the ultimate price for her crimes 
and would be one of the last people to be burned at the stake in England. The dubious honour of being the last person to be burned at the stake going to another Catherine, Catherine Murphy, a counterfeiter in 1789, with the punishment being abolished in the following year, 1790. So, there we have it. A very dark case from the past. Thank you for watching and subscribing, and if you haven't subscribed yet, please consider giving that button a nudge right now. We really appreciate it. Right then, until next time, take care, and I'll see you in the next one.